congratulate uh, all of you for being here after this uh, exciting and long morning. Uh, maybe you've come for the food, too. Uh, but we hope to provide food for thought. Uh, I'm from Institut Montaigne. We're co-organizing uh, this roundtable uh, with the ORF. And I have to, to commend uh, Samir uh, Bouchandas and the rest of the gang for the incredible work that they're doing to make all of this happen and to thank them for being able to, to do this. Uh, coming from another think tank, of course, we have the propaganda from our think tank on digital issues, uh, 5G and so forth, at the right of the room if you want to avail yourself of it as we leave. Uh, and now I've done my job, I can shut up. Uh, I'm going here to moderate uh, the round table, uh, if I can. Uh, get back to the right. Where is it? Because as you know, we don't have huge. My God. It's, uh, it's embarrassing. Incredible, so. Digital, digital binaries, 5G, and the new tech wars. Really, two topics folded in one. I'm going to introduce the speakers in a second, uh, but I just want to have a few words uh, on the choice of topics itself. Uh, it's like a, a, ca a chiasm. We're first looking into pretty straightforward and analytical and very te techy issues about 5G, plus, of course, the security issue, plus all the hot potato uh, political issues that we know of uh, and that are uh, burning, I would say, simultaneously, uh, I would guess, in many countries, including in this region and in Europe. Uh, and these are important issues uh, uh, that I hope the speakers will address. And beyond that, there is something that is, to some, is a hot potato issue, to some is already burning, to others is a more speculative topic of the possible fragmentation inside globalization through value chains, through the issue of tech transfers, uh, either tax transfer or access uh, uh, by tech products to, to, to other markets, uh, which is an issue that's literally moving every day. If we just look at the news cycle yesterday and this morning, and if you scratch just beyond the phase, so-called phase one trade deal between the US and China, you'll find new treasury regulations in the US promulgated just today that strengthen CFUs and strengthen it from the point of view of tech transfer and from the point of view of access by uh, foreign tax to American markets on, on, on very issue. And I'm using this example, but this is by no means a discussion that is confined uh, to America. So we're going to have to do a bit of both. Uh, and uh, I, I, I've also watched, if many of you were with uh, us, uh, the EU roundtable this morning, and uh, been fascinated once again by the dispute among a few Europeans, which would leave you with the impression that Europeans can't agree uh, on anything. Uh, on 5G and tech, I want to confirm that we uh, uh, agree not to disagree, basically, among Europeans. There is a, a position which will emerge, which some will say is a bit hypocritical, some will say it's a bit ambiguous, but others will say it's a way of covering uh, ourselves, and I would tend just this is just my initial statement, but if, if there is an occasion, I will uh, amplify it. Uh, we try and not give hold to others uh, that would use and dig and deepen the eventual uh, disagreements uh, that may exist. And I would say that it's a, a virtue of Europe and of the EU particularly uh, to achieve what I would call a synthesis uh, on the issues. I'll try and be a little more specific as things go to, but I have to do my job as a moderator, not as a speaker. Uh, and so the order we have decided on is slightly different uh, from uh, the one which is on your uh, list. We have uh, first a gentleman who is my colleague at Institut Montaigne, Gilles Babinet, 
uh, who is actually French digital champion, who is also an entrepreneur uh, in the, in the uh, IT sector, and who has uh, written actually in French a number of excellent uh, books on, da on uh, big data uh, issues uh, uh, that are really quite close to the topic. And, but he's less of a policymaker, shall we say. So he will present some of his tech ideas about all this uh, as a kind of background backdrop for the discussion. Uh, we will move next to the excellent uh, Mr. Shiv Sahar, who is additional secretary at the uh, National Security Council Secretariat in India, uh, who is in charge of the much wider domain of non-traditional domestic security, including also some international aspects. And I gather that there is a room, there is room for lots of things in non-traditional, but he does uh, cover uh, cybersecurity uh, and digital issues, among others. And previously to that, it'll be interesting to note that he was posted in Yanmu and Kashmir, uh, uh, so, uh, which has some, uh, currently some uh, relevance, I would add. Uh, we will then move to somebody who is uh, very close to my heart because she has uh, Elena Noor uh, from Kuala Lumpur, has uh, run for a long time an organization and important security NGO in Asia Pacific called CSCAP, Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific. I ran the European Secretariat for a the small European Secretariat for a decade. We were the, some of the outside participants to that. She has, a, if you can uh, look at it, uh, an extensive uh, experience in various traditional and non-traditional security aspects. She's currently with the Daniel Inouye uh, Center for Pacific Security in Malaysia, uh, and uh, she will give us uh, her views from uh, Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Leslie, Leslie uh, Seebeck, and I gather that the uh, first, the second first name, <laughs> is it, the, do we say it in English, the second first name? Second the, name. the second name was a, was a misprint. Uh, <laughs> so it's really Leslie Seebeck, uh, who is the uh, director or CEO of the Cyber Institute at ANU in Sydney, and who has had uh, a number of public hats uh, previous to that, uh, and we'll definitely look at all this from the policy uh, and uh, assessment uh, point of view uh, from Australia. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the excellent Chris Painter, who is currently the president of the Global Foundation uh, for uh, Cybersecurity Issues uh, in the US but who before that has been for such a long time, I would say, Mr. Cybersecurity or Mr. Cyber Issue mm -hmm. with the State Department. And so I would presume uh, we'll have a lot to say both on policy and perhaps on the, on the substance of, present, uh, of the present uh, dilemmas and choices. So we have an excellent cast. Uh, I will ask each of them not to speak for more than eight or nine minutes uh, but we have until 2.50, so if they respect uh, the timetable, there would be plenty of time for interaction uh, with you following their presentations. Uh, so I start uh, with uh, Gilles Babinet. Thank you, Francois, and um, thank you everyone for joining this um, discussion. And obviously, thank you for the resonant dialogue for organizing such a wonderful event. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I have to say that I'm not a diplomat, uh, neither a civil servant, but uh, quite interested in, in everything that touches uh, uh, technology and um, policy making in general. Uh, as uh, Francois said, I have a more an entrepreneurial background and um, I recently tried to understand how the, the platformization of the world is uh, changing the social and uh, economical landscape in general. And I believe to that extent, 5G is kind of a big breakthrough. So it's, it's quite interesting because I, I believe that we all hear about it, but uh, if I were to ask uh, most uh, people and probably here, 
how to summarize it, uh, I believe that uh, generally speaking, the feedback that I would get is about bandwidth, speedness, and uh, latency, which actually are probably quite important into um, this norm. Uh, but what you have to have in mind is that it's not an incremental norm. Uh, the difference in between 4G and 5G is, I would say, comparable to 1 and 2G. We went from um, a, a very low-level technology to a cellular technology uh, from 1 to 2G. And in here, um, we are introducing a few features uh, that makes it completely different. The goal is certainly to be able to bring more bandwidth and more speed, but I it's more than that. Uh, the real goal is to be able to, to deal with uh, what we expect to, to have in the network within the next 10 years, which is probably 100 billion uh, IoT devices um, that would be a lot into your house, your cars, and certainly into uh, the, the productive system, meaning supply chain and industry. And that's the real goal. Which makes that, uh, to, to achieve that, you have to bring in new features. Uh, the features to subdelegate the administration of the network uh, to third parties, that could be your client. For instance, uh, a big factory, let's say a raffinery, uh, could have I its, its own network and will be able to interpret and uh, to, to monitor this network in, in very, I would say, large manners. Um, the second aspect is uh, the fact that you can have some loop network, I would say that we would call a software-defined network, uh, that will make that um, the usage of the bandwidth will be much more efficient than before. Uh, the way you, you mingle two different networks or two uh, towers, signals, is completely different. It's, it's really much more efficient than before. And we wouldn't be able to deal with all these uh, new devices if we hadn't this, uh, this type of, of features. Um, and um, this makes that, you know, overall, on the long run, uh, it will be key to the productive system. It will be comparable to energy today. You know, we know how much we value energy. Uh, it's key in the strategy, and uh, I would say the, the geo-strategic uh, vision of the world. It's going to be the same for the networks in general. You know, so that's key that uh, policymakers, civil servants, politicians, better understand what is at stake with this technology. And and you know. In my background, I've been working with these people, and uh, I have always been very surprised that they don't really understand this aspect. It's certainly not the case in here, but I urge you to, to spend more time to really understand uh, what it relates to, uh, because um, most of the key aspect of um, your work will be tied to it in the near future. So I'll give you a few ideas. I believe that if you don't manage well these uh, networks, um, th the first um, thing that could occur, I believe, and which is not so much discussed, is um, the productivity gain that you would be able to benefit from it won't be there. So it, it, th there will be huge differences in between uh, A country to a B country, depending on, on the way they regulate and implement the, um, the, the 3G, the, the 5G, sorry. And uh, it's um, just to, to give you a, a very small idea, um, you're going to be able to register into the network billions of devices. Uh, usually, this is made through, I would say, vendors, telcos, uh, manually. And in here, you're going to be, a, you will have to automize uh, this process. And should you not be able to, to do that properly, you might miss a lot of productivity gain uh, in general. So that's one of the key aspects. And the other is obviously uh, relates to the, the business secrecy. You know, if you don't 
handle well the network, uh, you will let all the players, potentially all the states, uh, be able to, 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 to get into the network and to either introduce weakness, take business secrecy and, and bring it back to the countries. So that's a very strong aspect as well, which is very much tied to the current discussion on Huawei. Uh, obviously, I'm sure we're going to discuss that later on. A and the last thing, which I believe is um, probably um, quite important as well, uh, is the notion of uh, privacy. The fact that uh, with all these devices um, spread, spread around, uh, we'll know a lot about you, about um, your everything you do, your behavior in general. And I, I think that um, the concerns that we had uh, over the past years with the, the big platforms, the social media and so on, might be increased uh, if we don't regulate properly this, uh, these uh, networks. So it's, it's uh, as you can see, and you know, I'm just touching upon very limited uh, issues and uh, opportunities with this uh, network. Uh, but I think that um, we have to have a level playing field and a level of expertise from uh, the people in charge, uh, which has to be increased uh, very strongly if we really want to, to, to benefit from the, the opportunities of uh, these uh, technologies and not to have some shift of power, of sovereignty, um, that would, on the long run, be dramatic for some countries that would not mm, properly handle these uh, this, uh, networks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Zil, uh, for this intro. Uh, from which I gather uh, that the security risks are, both the efficiency and the security risks are maximized uh, in the 5G network, the issue of entry points, which has been debated. I just note recently that the new European Commissioner for Industry and uh, IT issues, uh, uh, Thierry Breton, uh, explained that uh, in 5G, the uh, amount of data uh, being treated uh, on the what he called the periphery rather than the core mm -hmm. uh, was going to move from 20 to 80 percent, uh, which is sort of a backdrop on the discussion on core and periphery security on 5G. But I will stop there and uh, give the floor uh, quickly to the excellent Chief Sahai, uh, who will give us, uh, I guess, both his uh, learned technical expertise expertise and an Indian viewpoint on these policy issues. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, well, India has got um, several challenges coming up. Amongst them, <coughs> I would say that uh, massive urbanization, uh, food security, and uh, transportation for moving a very large population. Uh, <clears throat> this will obviously require uh, a lot of technology input. And therefore, we cannot be uh, behind the curve. Uh, we did miss out on the first industrial revolution. And consequently, um, those who benefited from the sec uh, first industrial revolution ended up colonizing us. Uh, we do not want to be colonized again. So I think uh, India is uh, very open to the idea of in induction of uh, technology. And that is why uh, where 5G is concerned, we are uh, open to uh, all options. And we are conducting trials. And that's open to everybody to come. Uh, the thing is that uh, if we want to make choices, with some people would like us to make choices. The thing is that there is not much competition in the field. So if you exclude one, you have an only option to go to the east to the other. So while this is happening, I'm sure uh, there are many countries who would be looking at this option of whether you are going to look uh, to the extent to which you will be willing to compromise on national security 
uh, at, at the cost of development. So the various options that are being put out by the competing countries who are trying to sell their technologies, and it's not only about 5G. It's a whole about, uh, I mean, of course, 5G is very fundamental, but <coughs> it's about a whole lot of other things. So I think uh, when we are talking about this, we have to also see about how much our pockets can afford. How much can we really afford to change our networks? Because this is all going to be intertwined. So if you, even if you're talking in terms of 5G and the first rollout will be on the uh, NSA platforms, can you really, can how many of us will be in a position to afford of wrenching out one particular technology and being able to replace it to the other? So it's your pockets will also de decide your policy. And that's where I think people who are selling these technologies have to be conversant because ultimately if you're wanting to make it exportable, it has to be affordable. And I think when ha having said that, India is also looking at uh, options of self-reliance. We cannot afford to be only dependent on import of technology. So we will move forward on this issue. I know where 5G is concerned, we've got, we're just about trying to get in there. We are nowhere near where the other countries have reached, but looking at our ability to be able to uh, make technology advancements in many other fields, I'm sure we will be there. There may be a, a, a delay in timing, but yes, there are options about leapfrogging as well. So all technologies are going to have a, a, a dual use, and they have the, uh, the problem about security as well. So it's not specific to a particular technology. It's an attitude that we, the countries need to acquire about technologies per se. And in India's context, uh, as I said, mentioned in the beginning, we have got very big development cha challenges, which can only be met with technology. And therefore, we would like to imbibe that, but not at the cost of, as I said, colonizing ourselves again. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. There is one that I want to put just now, perhaps, because you've been quite short, uh, which is to you, is security tradable? Uh, is it fungible uh, with uh, what you call the affordability uh, issues? Or do you have a, a, what I would call a fatalistic viewpoint, which some I've heard some in, a, in Southeast Asia, for example, express it, that somebody's going to spy on you anyway, uh, to use a very uh, simple expression, and therefore all solutions are all solutions are bad from that point of view. Uh, I just want to know a little bit more, if you can, before we move on, uh, on the background of this decision, apart from the uh, economic issue, which we'll discuss later. I'm not uh, talking about any decisions. As I said, that what the decision we have taken is that we are open to all possibilities, and that's why we are allowing uh, the trials to take place. So that's, that is the decision. I'm the, I was merely commenting about the fact that this is not only a decision with India's concern, but a lot of other uh, emerging economies will need to make. So the, it's addressing a larger question, so that those who are wanting to export those technologies also have to see its affordability. Because there's no point having a product which you ultimately nobody is willing to buy because it's too expensive or too insecure. Which brings us to the point is that even the, they have to, the, it's a question of trust. So if you want to build the trust, then it has to be open to testing and regulation as was being mentioned. So I think the people who are going to give out that technology also need to understand that part, that they have to build in trust. I understand that uh, <clears throat> there are questions being raised about certain countries and the kind of way they run their, uh, their systems, but the question remains still that uh, they will need to build the trust and the people who are going to offer the options also need to build the trust. So there has to be a joint uh, mechanism of monitoring and testing and a lot of transparency with regard to what the technology is all about, which I hope will come out when we are doing the testing. Thank you very much for the clarification. And I'll add that I guess the first company that is doing testing on 5G with Huawei in India happens to be Vodafone, uh, which is British with uh, some French uh, alliances. Uh, as well, so the issue uh, is clearly beyond uh, India. I will shift to uh, Elena Noor for her own presentation. Thank you, Francois. So I think uh, it's a perfect segue 
from what Mr. Shiv Sahal had to say. Um, as Francois mentioned in his introductions, I'm from Malaysia. And so what I'd like to do is offer you uh, a perspective from the Southeast Asian region, because I think it's very apt that we're talking about digital binaries. And therefore, it's also very uh, pertinent to remind ourselves that when we view the decisions or policy considerations of certain countries, we shouldn't also box ourselves into binary perspectives, um, into thinking how certain countries should decide or are deciding. Um, and so I'll try to explain this and flesh this out a little more in three points. First point being this, in Southeast Asia, um, the cost-benefit calculations and cost-benefit emphasis is very different from what we often see in the media, uh, particularly related to the West when it comes to 5G. And so a lot of the considerations in Southeast Asia are more focused on pragmatism and economic development. Um, as Mr. Shir Sahal mentioned, uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, like India, are also emerging economies. And therefore, economics is a huge driver. Socioeconomics within the ASEAN region, because of its people-centered focus, is a huge driver of uh, 5G and other technological-related capabilities. So what you see is that governments often talk about um, how to remedy the problems of urbanization, of expanding populations, of providing better public services for their people. On the operator side, of course, what you see um, are considerations of, oh, consumer revenue will potentially grow 6 to 9% with 5G. Enterprise revenue will potentially gain you know, by 18 to 20%. And so there are all these positives uh, that are being couched in economic terms. You also see uh, region-wide the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, you know, talk about connecting cities within the region through the Smart Cities Network. And so uh, if you're familiar with it, it's 26 cities throughout the ASEAN region um, that will have normative plans um, on their own and will somehow connect with each other through uh, different grids and networks in order to better provide for the people of ASEAN. I'll talk a little bit more about this because there are some uh, uncertainties related to the whole uh, security of the smart cities network. But this economic consideration and primary driver of 5G and other technological uh, capabilities in, in Southeast Asia does not mean, to my second point, that there isn't any consideration of security or security vulnerabilities uh, related to 5G in Southeast Asia. I think commentators often view decisions made in capitals in Southeast Asia very simplistically. Oh, you know, this capital is aligned to China and that cap capital is aligned to the United States, for example. It's not like that. Okay, security considerations are made behind closed doors. They're not public discussions. And this is true not only of the tech sector, but also in many other considerations um, in other domains. Um, you know, the South China Sea, for example, is a disputed issue. A lot of discussions are taking place behind closed doors from the security angle. And you see this reflected um, with the particular issue of 5G as well. Ministers have come out to say it's not that we're not aware of or uh, that we're sweeping under the rug these security considerations. This is precisely why we have test beds, why we have uh, use cases and, and, and rolling out our 5G plans to confirm or disconfirm or deny some of these allegations that we read about in the papers. Three, if you add on the geopolitical layer and try to view the 5G debate from geostrategic perspectives, you also have to take into account uh, the very long history of Southeast Asia having to deal with major powers, um, and Southeast Asia is not new to a great power competition. There is a very interesting survey that was recently released by the uh, Yusuf Isha Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, just released last week. And the survey 
polled about uh, 1,300 respondents throughout Southeast Asia from different sectors, government, public policy, uh, business and civil society leaders. Um, and the survey confirmed this, that many Southeast Asians are wary of great powers in general. It doesn't matter which great power you are. We all sleep with one eye open in the region. Okay? And so this applies to 5G as well. So the risk profile of espionage, for example, with 5G, as far as Southeast Asian capitals are concerned, is the same. Okay? We all expect to be spied on. It's just how much we can mitigate the risks. And as I mentioned, these concerns are being debated in, um, in private behind closed doors. Um, finally, and we can have more of a discussion about some of the things I've, I've uh, talked about. I just want to leave some time for this discussion. Let me just conclude by saying that although a lot of the discussion is focused on the economic positives of 5G, um, as I mentioned, with initiatives like the ASEAN Smart Cities Network, the uh, Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity, there hasn't been much discussion on the security angle of what uh, the newer technologies like 5G, like AI, and IoT, and all that. Those discussions are not taking place in public, which raises concerns, uh, particularly if ASEAN is supposed to be people-centered and people-focused. We don't have this discussion in public, and I don't see it in public documents uh, that are coming out of the <coughs> ASEAN Secretariat either. I've asked whether these discussions are taking place uh, in more private settings. I think governments are, are trying to grapple with this issue because they're still trying to understand some of the technologies um, that uh, governments are interested in, but not necessarily conversant in going back to Gilles point. And so, um, you know, capacity building is a huge issue that must be looked at when we're talking about um, understanding the rollout of 5G and other emerging tech capabilities. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize that we shouldn't view things from a binary standpoint, um, even if the topic of this panel has binary in it. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much uh, for providing a view which uh, where the built-in ambiguity and opacity looks very much superficially uh, like what European governments, uh, each for themselves, <coughs> are trying to achieve. Uh, ambiguity and opacity, behind which we have to guess what future choices or actual choices are. This is striking. It shows that there's a very, very large political component mm -hmm. uh, again. And I think in, uh, in what follows of the conversation, at some point, we'll have to try and disentangle uh, the actual facts and analysis from this political uh, angle. Uh, I, I'm tempted to say, just before, be, before uh, giving the floor to the next two speakers, uh, I'll use a French aphorism, which I will change. If it's raining, and if Donald Trump says that it's raining, do we have to assume that the sky is blue? Uh, for some of us, this is getting to be a problem. And yet we have to go <coughs> over that. And I would use just that phrase to try and disentangle the political from the technical. But I'll stop there. I'm, I'm also remaining ambiguous. Uh, and I'm sure you will help us, uh, Professor Seebeck, to uh, <laughs> bring more clarity to the security side of the discussion. Dina, for arranging this dialogue. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'm just going to sort of throw more fuel on the fire here. Uh, another aphorism appropriate to Australia at the moment. The, so technology, I've heard a lot uh, in the last couple of days and I hear it quite commonly elsewhere that technology is neutral, that really it's just the choices. I would argue that technology is a human activity in all its forms. How you build it, how you use it, your choices you make are inherently political. And uh, you can see that whether you choose to, you know, sort of go for the surveillance technology or whether you're you know, uh, aiming to protect privacy. A lot of these things do have dual or multi-use, I completely agree. But it's those choices that are shaping what we're doing. That's going to become even more the case and technology will be <coughs> even more political as AI starts becoming more and more used in our systems because that always in, uh, has ingrained inherent, inherent biases in it. And so we need to be very aware of that. And this is something that's, you know, from, if I put my policy hat back on, 
I think we have to get out of the way of just thinking of technology as being a separate issue and we, you know, we can deal with that separately. It's inherent to everything we do in our societies. The second point is, is also, and I noticed this particularly in the Australian context, is that politicians, decision makers, will look for point solutions. They're looking for magic bullets. The number of times I've heard about, and I've banned this language in my own institute, the blockchain, uh, I, you know, it's, it's deeply worrying. There is a, the blockchain there. Why don't we apply the blockchain? And we'll find that more and more uh, because technology is being, again, silver bullet, it'll solve our problems. Uh, and secondly, it's, it's, it's misunderstood. Uh, really, we have to understand technology as being an ecosystem. So even now when we talk about 5G, what are we going to, and you point, and I've, I'm going to, re again, there's echoes, I think, throughout the, uh, our conversation here. What are the other things we need in place to make that happen? And that ranges from everything from the business models we apply to the skills and capabilities to the infrastructure in other areas. So we have, you know, you take um, all sorts of internet of things, you know, in hospitals, for example, there's a car system. For example, you know, again, things like automated cars. Everyone says in Australia, great automated cars. The problem is, what happens when you have a kangaroo? Because it goes in and out and in and out of the car sensors. So there's a whole range of things there that we have to think through and a whole range of other technologies and way we see the world. The other problem is, too, is that there has been a fundamental shift in, the, in technology over the last 40 to 50 years, and that's called data and software. It is now malleable. You can try things in data and software you couldn't before. Uh, before, you'd have to build a physical prototype. Now you can model it. These are being democratised. They are in the hands of people. You know, you can sort of, you know, um, get a you know, seven-year-old to start scripting and actually apply these things on the internet. It's not in the hands of government as much as it used to be. And I think government and policymakers are still coming to grips with that. So it's a very different world we're going into. I'm expecting the 5G decision. Um, and again, given that Australia sort of, yes, banned it, I mean, the strategy there was one of denial. I think that's a holding strategy. It's got to be, again, what else is there is always my question. Uh, but the calculus behind that decision is going to be repeated over and over with other technologies. Number one, the technology itself, 5G, as Jill's Julie, just pointed out, is actually very complex. You have, it used to be these systems were just a core and the dumb point endpoints. Now a lot of the smarts are at the endpoints, or if they're going to be hacked, they probably end up being dumber or used for nefarious purposes. The things that are connected to it are also going to be even smarter and so on as well, and they're going to be swapped in and out all the time. These are very complex systems. So to deal with that complexity and the level of vulnerability these networks are bringing in, and bearing in mind, I mean, my job is to look at the dark side. It means I get the best lines, but I always take the negative view of things to start with, which, given I'm an optimistic person, is a bit, a bit um, <laughs> yes, a bit difficult. Uh, so given that, yeah, all the, there is so much upside here, but there's a, there is a downside, and we need to be aware of that. Now, if you hand it over to the National Security Committee, they will always look that's where I come from, they will always look at that dark side and they'll always take the worst view of things. And, you know, again, that's what we employ them for. So how do we think about these things? Well, the next thing you do whenever you're sort of, you know, confronted by this, you say, OK, what's our capability to deal with this? Now, we in Australia had some very smart engineers, a few, a handful, in our Australian Signals Directorate, who are able to look at the technology and say, there's a problem here. We don't have enough, and I would you know, ask you to point to me the government that has enough engineers who then can go and say, great, we'll make sure it gets put into place appropriately. We'll manage and monitor it. We'll make sure we can double check the assurances that we're given that's all okay. I can only guarantee you will find none of those people. Not in government, not providing those assurance capabilities. And you can see that already with the cell that the British government has with Huawei. If you read their reports, they've had to go back to our way and say, we don't have people with the capability to understand what you're doing. Give us some people. So what does that tell you about, you know, again, the assurances? So the next layer you look at, because all these are defence in depth, the next layer you look at is, what other assurances can we have for this technology? And you start looking at the companies. You know, and again, this is just good practice whenever you do something like mergers and acquisitions or due diligence. You know, you are, you know where their funding coming from? What about their IP? Is their IP sound? Uh, can we guarantee that they're going to be able to support us in the future and that they will do so? What happens if we hold them accountable? Are they going to be actually able to react? And again, I'll point to the Huawei example where vulnerabilities were pointed out and no action was taken. 
and what about the laws of the country in which they reside? So all these sort of things, I'm expecting these, this, this logic, this calculus will become more and more prevalent whenever we, you know, confronted with some of these big technology decisions. And so as policymakers, these are the things you need to think about and be able to assure yourself of. And in terms of international law, legal provisions, it's not enough to just deny and say, stop, no, we're not doing that. Why? Because, you know, it's been pointed out, this is going to come with a you know, huge economic benefit. What politician is going to turn this down? So what are the alternatives you're going to offer? You know, is it deny? Can we actually sort of, you know, build it? Let's start thinking about how we operate in zero trust environments all the way through the supply chains, all the way in our technology. Does that make you feel comfortable? These are the sort of questions we're going to have to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, also for raising the uh, important distinction between uh, actual verification and checking, which is an incredibly uh, difficult topic from everything we, we hear, uh, including, by the way, the, the, the report assembled by the British security people, staffed in part by engineers on loan from Huawei on Huawei, which concluded not only about the immense number of backdoors, uh, about the fact that Huawei was not uh, really up to correcting stuff, but also conclude that verification was an endless and permanent task, which leads us to the next issue, which is what is a trusted partner? What is trust, uh, not as opposed to verification, but in addition to verification? I think it's an important discussion that we go on. I stop there and give the floor to the Honorable uh, Chris Painter. Last but not least, um, again. Thanks. I'm not sure I'm honorable anymore now that I left the government. But uh, uh, I, you know, I, I'd say a couple of things, uh, and I agree with uh, much of what's been said in the panel, particularly what Leslie just said. But but I start from this perspective. It's good we're having this discussion, and the reason I say that is one of the reasons we're in this ish, this problem, really, you know, this dilemma, is because we weren't having the security discussion all along. I remember when I was at the White House in 2009. We were uh, trying to write our national cybersecurity strategy, and there was a lot of tension, frankly, between the, nat the you know, national security people, the people who did security issues, and the national economic people who did economic issues. And too often, I think, as we develop technologies and other issues, and even policies, we don't really factor in or take into account the security issues. They seem to be different camps. They seem to be different people and different agencies. And we need to bring those things together. And I think that what's happening with 5G is a failure of having that conversation much earlier. Uh, and, and I think that's important. So I think it's really good that Australia, and Australia really was the first country to raise the alarm bells on this <coughs> well before the US did, but the, the, the Australia raised it, and, and the, frankly, the US raised it. Now, I may have some quibbles in the way the US has done some of the things. I wouldn't say that we're not going to share intelligence with other countries. I don't think that's really very helpful. But I think it's important to raise the alarm bells and have this conversation. And the more we have this conversation, because this is not just going to be about 5G, this is going to be about other technologies that come down the pike. The th second thing I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, as, as Leslie was saying, this ends up being a risk management issue. But, you know, and I, I think we heard this from the first presentation, too, the risk profile here is far larger than 4G. Uh, you know, 4G was about, the biggest risk was interception of communications and, and, um, um, uh, and espionage. For 5G, it's not just about communications. It's about control of IoT devices. It's control of infrastructure. It, it, you know, given its bandwidth and the other things it allows, it will open up uh, a lot of uh, dependence of societies and electronic infrastructure and, not, and even physical infrastructure on these networks. So that means the risk of something going amiss is hugely larger or will be hugely larger than simply losing communications. So you have that much higher vulnerability risk profile. Then the question is, what, what are the risks and how do you mitigate it? And one of my former colleagues uh, from the White House, uh, Tom Donahue, just wrote an article two days ago uh, called, and I think this, this title really sums up the problem, uh, One Bad Day. And it's not so much about the surveillance issues. I mean, yes, that's an issue, and it'll be an issue in every technology, every communications technology we have. But, it's, uh, but you can find potential ways to mitigate that through encryption and other things that you can do. Uh, 
But what, what one bad day focuses on, in addition to having a very, very detailed explication of how we got here, you know, why these uh, combinations, these mergers led to just a few suppliers in the marketplace, uh, it talks about the biggest threat is not the, uh, not the confidentiality of data, which is the espionage issue, but the availability, uh, that if these networks are not available, and we are totally dependent on these networks, not just for communications, but for control of power and everything else, that could have a catastrophic effect on our societies. And so one bad day is all you really need. One bad day could really bring our various societies uh, to, to the ground, and that's, that's a scary thought. So that means the risk, the stakes are, are much higher. Um, then, then you look at you know, the, the threats, and I think other panelists have talked about some of the threats they've seen with 5G. Uh, the British report's been cited, and I think that's a good example. Whether deliberate or not, there are lots of flaws and, 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 uh, uh, and holes in the Huawei networks. Um, there is the political threat to the, in, in a different way, and I mean that, that you know, in the U.S., if the U.S. government says to a provider, you should have to do X, they can go to court. There are things that they, have to do, they can do to appeal that. In China, not so much. You know, if <laughs> the Chinese government, which by its own laws, clearly says that they have control of the networks and everything that's there, and they can tell the provider to do something, not that they've done it, uh, you know, not that they've done it right now, but they could do it in the future, that creates a huge risk too. Now, you might argue, and I think this is a fair point, that yes, China, and perhaps every country in the world has a reason to want to do intelligence gathering, and that's going to happen, and it's happened since the beginning of time. Does China, and if I think the bigger risk is availability, does China have a present intention to bring down the networks in Australia or bring down the infrastructure in Australia or the U.S. or in India? No, I don't think they do. But things could go wrong very quickly. If something happens in the South China Sea, if something happens with respect to Hong Kong or Taiwan, uh, that can change very quickly. And you cannot then mitigate that threat on a dime. You can't pull the things out of the network on a dime. And so that creates a real issue as well. Then you get to the other question, which other panelists have raised, is like, okay, well, great, there's a risk. Um, you know, and assuming, and, and there's an issue on that too. I mean, I think a lot of countries are saying it's cheaper uh, and it's available and we should go for that. And that's a fair point. But then your you know, societies, governments as a whole are not so good at, at evaluating long-term risk. So they say, well, the short-term risk might not be that small or might not be that big and it's much cheaper, so we'll buy it. So you have to, I think, factor in this longer-term risk. Um, and, and I don't think there's real good ways to mitigate if one of the problems is the, the Chinese government control and their ability to direct these entities, that's hard to mitigate it, frankly. I mean, how do you, 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 there's no technical mitigation for that. So how do you, you deal with that? Now, you can have code review and other things that we've talked about. And for the reasons I think that Leslie was pointing out, that's not very effective, frankly. Um, and uh, because there's so much, there's so much, the complexity of the code and the equipment is so great that you really can't do that, and you have to do that on an ongoing basis. But that all doesn't matter if there are no alternatives. And I, I think people have correctly pointed out we have very few alternatives in this space, and that leads me really to the, 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 the you know, one of the major things I want to talk about is, you know, why are we in this situation where we only have three providers <laughs> in the world, and, and the fourth one, the Samsung, is starting up? Uh, because we shouldn't be in that situation. We should have seen this coming. This is not something, this has been, <coughs> we've been talking about 5G for like at least six years or, or longer. So this has been a slow moving train that's been coming toward us. And we should have known about these risks. We should have taken some action. And the reason we haven't is because I think there was a lot, first of all, I think, again, governments think in short term and not long term um, uh, terms often. Um, second, uh, you know, I think there was a lot of opposition to what was the bad word often in, uh, in the West, or even in India, is industrial policy. You know, there was an idea we shouldn't be doing quote unquote industrial policy. The free market will solve all of this. Well, the free market hasn't solved it. This is the situation we're in because of the free market. So I remember a story, I remember uh, when I was in the White House, this is 2009, as I say, I was in the National Security Council me and one of my colleagues went and talked to people at the National Economic Council, and we said, look, 4G, you know, 4G is done. We're done with that. There's really not much more we can do in this case in terms of competition and, and having national or even regional or even partner champions. We need to start focusing on 5G. So 2009, that's somewhat of a lead-up time. And we were told by the economic people, we don't do industrial policy. <laughs> so uh, 
which is a very short-sighted way of looking at this. And, and to be sure, I don't think the U.S. is in a position, or many countries are in a position, to, to have national champions. But you can fund basic research. You can create incentives. You can do things not just nationally, but with your partners around the world. So there are other alternatives in the supply chain that there simply aren't. Um, and, th and that's a problem. Uh, you know, and this, again, applies to other technologies over 5G. We should be thinking about 6G now. Indeed, China is thinking about it. Um, even with all the security co uh, issues that have been raised, there's been more talk in Washington about having more funding for basic research, but that's not just a, it's not a few million dollars. You need a really kind of major effort. Uh, not quite the, uh, you know, the moonshot effort, but pretty close. I mean, if you're really going to compete in this space, there's a lot more that needs to be done because this is just the tip of the iceberg. 5G is really just the beginning. Um, so, so I think that as I look at this going forward, I think we have to try to mitigate the risks we have now, but we really should be focusing on how we create other competitors and trusted technologies in the future. And if we don't do that, we're going to be having the, th the same conversation in five years on another technology. Thank you very much. That so, completes the uh, initial presentations. I must say I'm delighted that uh, contrary to what one might have expected, you've all chosen to stay on the issue that has a lot of bones uh, rather than the more fluffy issue of the tech war that gives a base for a real conversation. I would like to, 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 to use my privilege to start it uh, by uh, taking off my moderator hat for a second uh, with seconding some of the uh, ideas uh, there. Uh, and I will proceed from, you know, political science, which is the, indeed the, not a very fuzzy thing, to more core technical issues. Political science, it's been years that I already heard in Brussels that no multinational company spent as much lobbying, uh, especially in Brussels, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Huawei. Uh, I personally wrote about subsidies to Huawei by the China Development Bank in 2009. Uh, and that got me uh, remarks during a visit to China. And if I counted the number of times that I've been approached directly or indirectly by Huawei uh, or some people I were working with or some people, it is incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's so strong that in fact sometimes I think it, it, it actually works against the purpose because you uh, either you, 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 you give up or, or you're really worn and you really begin to think that this goes beyond economic uh, issues and expediency. Uh, so that, that I think is the political side. And right now uh, in Europe, it is fascinating that the debate around security issues has made that company redouble its efforts to an incredible level uh, and, and, and very, very widely, and of course with some successes. Uh, the second remark I would make is on the economic uh, issue, uh, and I would partly get, slowly get into your own arguments, which I think are the real important uh, other side of the question that we have to, to consider the economic uh, cost. I'm looking at who is already wed to, to, to this company uh, in Europe, looking at the different countries. Poland, surprisingly, uh, almost number one, uh, but with a huge financing that came along uh, for 4G uh, by China, so which is a non-commercial deal. It was really a concessionary uh, deal with hundreds of millions of dollars conceded. So you, you can't say it's a purely economic situation. Not surprising today that Poland, which in other aspects cannot really be suspected of being widely pro-communist uh, parties or CCP or, or, or whatever looks like it, uh, sort of makes an exception with Huawei just because it's very hard to get of this wedlock uh, once you are uh, committed to the company which has a lot of proprietary uh, designs, it's difficult to mix it with other systems. Uh, you have German companies uh, and Italian companies and the French except in France, which is fascinating. This is why I said uh, 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 <coughs> Vodafone is married to Orange and, and this is clearly an economy scheme but this is I would contradict Chris on one small aspect, which is not a result of market economics. It's a result of tax policies. We make a lot of money. The public system makes policy, makes money by selling frequencies, uh, sells, it, sells them at a very high price. Uh, and then the uh, European Commission that wants to prove it's useful for the market uh, 
creates more competition than exists either in Asia or especially in America. So these telcos are faced with, uh, you know, cutthroat uh, economic competition between one another and heavy taxing uh, of frequencies. That's where Huawei comes in again. I, I would say the, 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 the economic factor exists, but it's accentuated uh, by, by, uh, by that fact. And then I will get to the nitty-gritty argument because I feel very much what, what, for what Mr. Sahai said, you know, about avoiding colonization uh, and dependency. In a way, when we talk about digital sovereignty uh, in Europe, we don't use the word colonizations because we, we used to be on the other side of the, of the stick, uh, but we really mean the same thing, uh, 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 regaining sovereignty or avoiding to lose it. Uh, on the other hand, I look at what's the situation in Europe, and I'll use the example of the company again. The main sellers today of high voltage, really high voltage lines, including above 1 million volts now, but almost anything above 300,000 volts, are Chinese. Guess uh, who is the software provider uh, for all these high power lines and distribution system? That's Huawei. Uh, it's some sort of a dependency. I'll use an anecdotal argument. Uh, the French, you know, they, look to li they used to like Citroën, which some of you may remember. We have a new Citroën, top-of-the-line car called DS7. Our high officials love it. Uh, the electronics, the media, everything is supplied by Huawei. So that French officials uh, who discuss uh, this issue uh, discuss it in cars uh, whose electronics are supplied by Huawei. So talk about dependency. We're already quite there. Uh, I am less uh, sensitive, you know, I'm very sensitive to the financial arguments about dependency on the on the so-called uh, uh, Google uh, Alphabet, uh, Facebook, uh, Amazon, and so on, when it comes to economic and tax issues. But on network dependency, this is very uh, fascinating. Finally, uh, and before I give the floor, just to give you a taste of European positions at this point, the most reliable guide remains the, the, the EU risk assessment uh, that was published uh, in October. Uh, which, however, has yet to be confirmed. Uh, the, it had to be concluded by recommendations, which I notice are late in coming, which could indicate that there is still some uh, debate uh, around that. Uh, but it's, it has, it, as almost all governments do, avoid to name names. So the name of the company they have used about 20 times is never used, uh, not even once uh, in that report. But the gist of the report talks about the risks, talk about the issue of trust, talk about the issue of the interaction between companies and the state uh, where they originate very strongly, uh, and explains that uh, from that point of view, there are very different suppliers. So in just about every way but in naming, uh, raises a flag. How much that flag is going to be raised up the pole, how much uh, Governments are going to wish to stay in ambiguity. My belief here is that some ambiguity by some government breeds more ambiguity by other governments. And at the end of the line, you have no common policy. That's a risk. For Europeans, it may be a risk elsewhere. Uh, but on the whole, I would say that the debate has shifted uh, considerably in Europe on this issue over the past year. I stop there. I've been to Please state your name and affiliation before uh, asking your question. Yeah, I'm, I'm Andrzej Zalewski, I'm from Poland, so I was compelled by your... Uh, <laughs> um, I don't think it's so bad, um, but it's um, um, my question, I, so I will move private think tank, so I can use every name, um, even Huawei. Um, so imagine you are a prime minister of a middle-sized country and you don't want your economy to miss the train. So I heard much things about risks, but what are the solutions? We don't have our own technology. We don't want to use to miss the train of great opportunities. So what do we do? Two or three and revert. Now, uh, Sophie, and, and, and uh, that's Nyan, right? 
Okay, Sophie Boisseau. I, I would like the same kind of question. Can, can you introduce yourself, yeah, please? Yeah, I'm Sophie Boisseau du Rocher from uh, IFRI Paris. Uh, I've got the same kind of question for uh, Elena Noor, you know, on, uh, on Southeast Asia and ASEAN. Um, because, in fact, what we understood is that uh, the system is going to be much more complex and difficult to control within the next uh, 20 years. So the trend is here, and uh, there is a structural divide uh, between expert and non-expert countries, I would, I would basically say. Um, so when, when you talk about the Southeast Asian position, not to have to uh, make a binary uh, ch choice, so what do you mean by that? I mean, is a mix possible? I mean, you know, in Southeast Asia, we see everything. And my, my question would be, uh, don't you think that this topic has the potential to uh, demonstrate the fallacy of the sovereignty <coughs> narrative by <coughs> ASEAN? I could ask the same risk, uh, almost the same risk exists for Europe. Yeah. Uh, y your turn, and, and you please introduce yourself, Naya. I'm um, Nayan Chanda. I'm from Ashoka University in Delhi. Uh, my question is to all panel. Uh, the issue really with Huawei is a question of trust. And that tr question arises because of two Chinese laws, the counterintelligence law of 2014 and national security law of 2017. These two laws require all Chinese companies to surrender the data they have uh, to the Chinese government. So as long as that law is in place, how can you trust Huawei that what it is gathering in its network is not going to be shared with the Chinese government? Thank you. Some people scratch their head about those laws because they would say it went without saying anyway, but that's where we are. Who wants to Okay, uh, just just a, a few words. I, I think it's something that hasn't been mentioned that uh, you know th there are ways probably to to tackle the issue of the um, the network security and integrity. Uh, something which has been I would say uh, suggested by the EU memo is the notion of uh, reference uh, architecture, and I think it's a, it's a very good way. Uh, personally, I'm quite involved in technology and. Uh, I think that uh, if you are able to kind of really rule precisely the type of architecture you want into in the network, for instance, first obviously not having only one single vendor, uh, and secondly to have some c network monitoring in a very decentralized way, which makes that if you have a weakness in the, work in the network, it doesn't necessarily spread out. So I, I, I don't want to be technical in here. But this is a very uh, interesting opportunity, and uh, we should look deeper into it. But it means that we need to have technical guys on the government side, which to me isn't the case. You know, uh, at the EU level, um, DG Connect is obviously uh, quite skilled. But I wouldn't say that um, there is a a fluent conversation in between the DG Connect and the uh, state members' um, technical capacities in general. And this makes that, you know, it we haven't seen yet uh, the final memo. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say, I'd like to answer to, to your point about um, the Chinese um, laws. But, you know, NSA, uh, the US government has exactly the same laws. The only thing is, we believe it's a we have partnerships with, I mean, as European with uh, the US, and um, that since it's a democracy, uh, it's okay. But the Edward Snowden scandal proved the contrary. You know, these people use massively the data for, I would say, economical reason. You know, the, the what we've known from the audition at the Senate is that it wasn't for security purposes. It was to hack the um, commercial information to, to advantage the US in general. So I, I think that you know, it raises again the fact that we have to that extent no auditability, 
the only thing that we can probably do is to put our hand in the dirt and try to better navigate into the uh, architecture of the network. It, to me, it's the only solution that I can see. Thank you. I'll move to, to, to Chris Painter, perhaps. Uh, loading your plate, since you asked yourself the question about alternatives, how far do you think we are from the open radio access network uh, path to 5G? And uh, do you believe in uh, alliances between these European providers, Samsung, <coughs> the American software <coughs> providers? How, how, where do you think we are on that? I, I think we can create trusted supply chains, but we're well, well really far, be, you know, far uh, uh, behind the curve in that. So it's going to take a while to do that. Uh, I, you know, I understand there's a lack of alternatives. I think there's, there's reasons we're there. Uh, but I think we can do some things to, to generate that. I think uh, you know, one of the questions I hear a lot of people raising is cost issues. Look, I think, and I think you mentioned this too, that India too has to think about its supply chain and, and maybe do some more indigenously. So I think we're going to have to do this. We're also going to have to figure out how to deal with untrusted technology. So um, on the legal question, you know, it is not just, I mean, yes, those laws are in place. That raises a concern. They are different than the U.S. laws. I, you know, I, that there, you know, there's no appeal from the Chinese laws. There's no transparency on whether or not uh, these, you know, that China has ever made these orders. So there's a big difference, I think, between the U.S. and that. And I'd also, frankly, you know, flatly uh, uh, disagree with our, our, our technical speaker in the sense that, uh, you know, the U I, I led our U.S.-China uh, negotiations on IP theft, and we reached an agreement back in 20... 15 on that. Now the agreement's kind of fallen apart, but it was a landmark agreement at the time. Uh, and the U.S. is not using these things for commercial purposes. Now there's a lot of things to be said about Snowden and reform of intelligence procedures, and a lot of that debate happened in the U.S. afterwards, but that is different than I think what we see in the Chinese laws. Uh, the last thing I'd say is those two laws that you mentioned, I think those are a concern, but there's another concern, which is the lack of appealability and those laws deal with the access to data, but again, I'm also concerned about the availability of data, that someone could interrupt the, the availability entirely, and they don't need those laws to do that, and that could come, again, as a political matter from the government. Uh, and, and we have to find, find ways to make sure that if we're gonna trust these suppliers, we can have trust in that not happening. Thank you. Mrs. Seebeck and then Alina. Okay. You want to Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just in terms of what to do if you're a middle middle power or middle middle sized country. So what Australia did was uh, basically say, uh, did the denial say you know sort of said basically uh, we're not having high risk vendors in the country in our in our 5G networks, and they left it up to the commercial companies to figure it out. So it wasn't as though it was the government going to put the 5G networks in. They just create the you know regulatory environment, and that's what that's what they did. Having said that. Uh, Again, that, as I referred to before, is a denial strategy. And my question is always, okay, what's next? So you can have a denial strategy. It's only, that's stop. What else do you go do? So obviously you need to go off and start doing things like building capability. That's more into R&D, more into building your skills and your people. Because you need the people to be able to, you know, actually understand what's going on. You cannot, and again, this is a matter of sovereignty too, you cannot actually <coughs> say, um, right, I'm going to outsource my knowledge on this area. Uh, and you can't do it on a whole range of things. And I think, just to come back to a point made by Chris too, over the, over the years, we've just let that understanding, you know, sort of go away. I've, I would actually put it back to about oh, 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. We just let it go. And again, I'll give another example in that field. In the US, for example, there used to be about 300 defence companies. Now there's six primes. So we're seeing this consolidation and lack of, you know, uh, and sort of uh, monopolization across a whole range of these technology areas in a whole, whole range of industries. So I think it's incumbent on company, you know, nations now to actually start rethinking and rebuilding these capabilities. As well as that, you might start thinking about, again, what, do, what, does, it, what does it mean to operate in that zero trust environment? And part of the problem about trust is that, you know, cyber erodes trust. We're seeing societal change erode trust in institutions. Trust is being eroded all the way down, what I call, all the way down the stack. Uh, just on the Chinese laws, I completely agree. If they were to withdraw those laws, though, I'm still not sure we would, you know, again, feel comfortable because it comes back to 
ideologies, norms of governance, all those things which actually aren't necessarily written down, but we all understand. We all, you know, there's a lot of, in, particularly in democracies, that we understand how to behave and what our expectations are that aren't written down. And if we just go back to the letter of the law, we're missing out on a lot. Thank you, Elena. So the, the survey I mentioned earlier, you know, 26% of respondents in Southeast Asia when asked which provider they trusted the most for 5G networks in the region, um, chose Samsung, which is interesting, right? Because Samsung is not even a front runner in Southeast Asia. And so that gives you a sense that a lot of Southeast Asian countries are facing this dilemma, would rather not be caught in the middle of this decoupling exercise that seems to be happening right now. Um, but I think a mix is the reality right now in Southeast Asia. So for example, you have Thailand, which is the US's oldest treaty ally in Asia, you know, rolling out uh, test beds with Huawei. Uh, you have Singaporean telcos uh, partnering with both Huawei as well as Ericsson. And the same thing in Malaysia. And so it, this is very classic Southeast Asia, right? We hedge, we enmesh, and the mitigation I think we completely understand Southeast Asian countries being at the technological stage that they are will not be able to mitigate at a dime. Um, but there are other ways of mitigating. You know, you do it diplomatically as best as you can. You try to minimize the risks in other ways. And you've seen this in other domains like in the maritime domain as well. So we're really trying to cope and struggle. But uh, the mix is the reality right now. And I don't see Southeast Asia um, picking sides either way. Thank you. Uh, I'll move to a second round. You, you, and two over there, which makes four, and I'll stop there. That's a lot already for the second round. Um, I'm Joshua Johnson from the US. Um, a few members of the panel brought up questions of economics and the 5G market, and, um, and so I wanted to talk about that a little bit more and ask in the Indian context. You know, you have three major telcos in India, two were heavily indebted, one is on the verge of bankruptcy. There was recently a Supreme Court decision which levied $18 billion of fines on an already struggling sector. The firms don't really seem willing or able to buy 5G spectrum. And even driving around Delhi, you see you're lucky to get 4G half the time, and even beyond that, 3G sometime, and often nothing. So is this really the most useful or efficient use of resources at the moment right now in India because even the telcos are telling me we need more 3G and 4G. Not to mention the fact that you're an incredibly price sensitive market where people are at a race to the bottom in terms of average uh, revenue per user. There's a price war. There are really no IoT linked devices in India. People have already ruled out use cases like autonomous vehicles or remote surgery. So what's it for? Who's going to buy it? Who's going to pay for it? Why do they even need it? OK, interesting question. But I think it leads to an issue of discrimination, which the maybe Indians will not be happy with. Uh, and I would say, I would just, but I'll, I'll move to the second question. I don't want to answer it. Yeah, maybe because that was very strong, very strong as a question. Yeah, so the question is that if we don't need it, then why are you trying to sell it to us? If you don't need it? If we don't need it, mm -hmm. then why are you trying to sell it to us? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was, OK. That was, I was going to say very quickly that needs for manufacturing and needs for consumers are very different. But second question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Faris Adrovich. I come from Bosnia. Um, the question is, um, is there a war of um, worlds, so to speak, um, when we had technology previously, it came from another um, part of the world, and it was acceptable. But now that we have a new technology arising coming from another part of the world, it seems to be problematic um, to, to the world that has invented technology initially. Um, and the other question is, um, is 5G synonymous with Huawei? Do we have alternatives? Are there other competing te technologies? And um, the other third sort of uh, question is the centralization. And there was a point made by, um, I think, several speakers that we have 
uh, now a, a consolidation of uh, corporations and um, technology within a few corporations, uh, which wasn't the case before. Now, what about um, other technologies such as the blockchain, which goes the other way around? Um, are there ways to implement such technologies for security measures, uh, precisely because of uh, not having um, consolidated power within a few? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I don't remember in what order there were two of you. Yes. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Threlfeld from the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Um, I want to focus a little bit on other ways that governments are using cell networks. We're seeing increasingly, um, and I'm referring to internet shutdowns. Um, so more and more across South Asia and elsewhere, this has become a feature of um, security control um, by governance regimes. And I wonder if there are implications for 5G, for the Internet of Things, for this practice that we're seeing of internet shutdowns? Is it going to be possible to selectively target certain areas, um, certain you know, handheld devices, for example, as opposed to a fridge? Um, what might that future look like? Um, my name is Yasu Kim. I'm from South Korea. And um, it's actually more of a comment not question. So like, because anyway, South Korea is just right next to China. We also some we also have some kind of like perspectives that maybe like the US and other European countries do not have. I mean like, because it's our neighbor, we also share some kind of like histories back then. So like from China, China's perspective, I mean like then the presence of like Google and some like American companies in their territory can actually be threatening sometimes, right? So that's why like Google, Chinese government just has some kind of like discussions about whether they should allow Google to have their offices inside their territories or not, right? But at the same time, cause I mean like South Korea, we also produce, we also produce a lot of like mobile devices like Samsung, right? But some part of like Samsung devices also come from Huawei. And so there used to be some like articles saying that, um, like criticizing that, like Samsung actually uses some kind of like Huawei parts. So it was also very like huge concern within Korean society as well. But here, I, I mean like it's very complicated issue. I mean like it's not only about security, but it's also about the trade. Like it's, I mean the supply chain these days is just too interlinked. No, just no one part is made, no just one mobile device is made entirely within just one territory, right? So that's the issue. So, but like without all this kind of like explicating like this complicated like supply chains, how can we solve this problem? I mean like, so from, from, from my perspective, I think this is really the problem of the trust. And um, I do, um, think that this somehow needs to be um, solved with the international law so that it can be definitely like dealt with some kind of like consent and trust. So yeah, that's my comment. Thanks. Thank you very much. Those are four questions. Uh, I don't know in what order or who really wants to, to address these. Who is You'll say something at some point, but then who wants to go first? That's why. Ali, at toi. Great. I'd like to answer your question first. Is uh, uh, the reason why we need 5G is because uh, we can't afford not to have it. The reason is basically that uh, we'll have network congestion very soon. Uh, for instance, if you should look at mature markets, the growth of the data usage is more or less 15% every month. And it won't sustain very long, you know. So you need to have more advanced technologies that can, in the same spectrum, be able to cope with much more data. And I mean, apart the the, the price of the licenses, uh, it's it's much better, much enhanced technology in general. So it's uh, and on the long run, much cheaper, you know, truly cheaper. So it's. Uh, if you were just willing to handle voice with millions of billions of people, 
at some point you might be obliged to use uh, 5G. You know, if everybody were to have conversation at the same time, you need it. So I don't talk about autonomous car, you know, like uh, Industry 4.0 and so on. You, we need it. It's as simple as that. Um, to just to second question is uh, uh, what do we have to have concern with uh, 5G, especially, you know, and uh, you know, very basically because it's different from before. It's a platform technology. In the past, it was very difficult to bring down the entire network with a virus. Uh, this is a software technology, what we call, I quote it, a software-defined network. You can really uh, stop an entire country. You know, what is happening in Ukraine, for instance, could be happening everywhere at a much larger scale. You know, so this is why I believe we need to, to have very high concerns about uh, the way we implement the, this, uh, this uh, technology. And to address your point, yes, we can have local shutdown. We can shut down specific people, whatever, from, uh, I would say, any monitoring uh, um, center of the, of the network, and that's a very big concern. Because you, you could, as let's say, as uh, a cyber threat from an external country, you could say to government, I will stop just your financial system and the rest will work. Or I'll stop the left wing people, whatever, you know. So that's, that's a real concern. That was a clear answer. Who wants to come in? Maybe Chris? Yeah, got it on. Um, just a couple of observations. One, I don't think it's, um, it's too simplistic to say, oh, this was good when the West was doing it, but now that China's doing it, it's not good. I mean, I, I think really uh, the concern, and it really goes back to what many people have said, whether they agree on these issues or not, it's a trust issue. And so if you're trying to engender trust and you're worried about what a nation state will do to control its own suppliers, what you want is maximum as possible transparency. You want accountability. You want the abil ability to appeal. You want things that are built into that legal system, which we don't have in this case. And so can China achieve that? Maybe. Uh, I, I, you know, not, their current system doesn't allow that. They're, it's very like the government says to do it, do it. Uh, but that's, I think, where the, the real concern comes in. On the, the issue of um, uh, international law, look, I think um, I can't even see how international law would be able to address this adequately uh, or t in a timely manner. I think if we, you know, I'm even trying to think of what the international instrument would look like for, for technology development, and, I, and it's, not, it's not gelling in my mind, even though I'm a recovering lawyer, so, uh, so I haven't really figured that out. And so I don't think that's <laughs> probably the most productive path that goes down. I think we really do have to think about some of the technical angles. I think it should be looked at, but, but as I look at the regulatory bodies that are out there internationally, we have the ITU and others, and I just don't see something coming out of that body that's going to be helpful with this, this uh, debate. Uh, I do worry about, you know, one of the other things I've done is uh, worked with the, what's called the Freedom Online Coalition, very worried about internet shutdowns. I do think I agree uh, with our, our technical speaker, I'll call him, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that this does enable that more, and I think that's a concern. It also enables, you know, states doing more surveillance, and that's a concern too. So I think, uh, and, a and, and, and both targeted in another way. So I think we have to control for those things. We can't just look at all the good of <laughs> technology. And then finally, on the supply chain issue, um, you know, I, I do think, um, I do think that's a concern, but, but simply because you have foreign parts is not the whole story. You have to look at the product, you have to look at the services, you have to assess the overall <laughs> risk. Uh, there is global supply chains. The one, th you know, as I said, I, I agree with the U.S. raising the alarm bills. I agree with the U.S. saying this is a real security concern. <coughs> I'm not so sure I agree with the U.S. saying uh, U.S. suppliers cannot supply parts to Huawei because that drives them to become more independent and develop their own uh, software where now they're kind of dependent on Western technology. So I think we have to think through those economic and security things together. Thank you. Uh, Eddie now. 
Um, I mean, I, I do agree that there is a real risk of internet shutdown, um, and, but I, I do think that there is a space for um, norms in particular to be socialized um, in many countries. So, you know, just common sense things like we're not going to attack your critical infrastructure, especially if it's a 5G powered in, um, later on, talking about the availability of data and all that. So there is a real uh, opportunity for there to be uh, more capacity building, more training in terms of just trying to uh, get governments to understand not only the technologies, but also kind of the, the regulatory norms that should underpin um, the use of these technologies. Thing to that. Um, bo both of us are on this Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace, which came out with its report recently. And I think the idea of global norms coupled with accountability. So norms are great, but if people violate it, there have to be their accountability and consequences. So you have to have those things acting together. And capacity building, uh, this other organization I'll talk about in our next panel is uh, the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise, is trying to do more global capacity building. So that's, uh, India, and India has been a close partner on that. So that's something we need to do more of as well. Are, are we, you want to add a word too? Okay, I, w I want to have my own comment too, right. so please, please do it. So okay, very, very quickly, three things. Firstly, your point about 3, 4, 5G, et cetera, and in, is in that you know, sort of uh, uneven distribution reminds me of William Gibson's quote, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. That, it, to me, is mu it's not technology that you should worry about. Yeah. This is where your social policy and economic policies really come in. This is what I'm talking about. You can't do just this sort of thing in isolation. Uh, second, yes, you could do things like security in the blockchain, but why would you? Uh, you know, there is, it's blockchain, but it can be used for things like um, assurance and so on, but there's other sort of things like hash tables and a whole range of other things as well. And you need the defense in depth. So it's, a lot of it's social, you know, making sure that people understand, have the right culture. Uh, third, uh, just on the internet shutdowns, this is a really good point that illustrates to me why you need to balance everything you do in this space with an assurance around protection of personal liberties, for example. Uh, we need to think about what it means to be a, you know, someone, a, a enfranchised citizen in a digital democracy, rather than someone who's constantly just shut, you know, subjected to a whole range of different you know, um, things coming from a top or from a technical elite that we just don't you know, don't know and can't, and, uh, can't uh, access. So we need to think about digital civil rights in this respect. Talking about internet shutdowns, <coughs> I would imagine that the question would be largely targeted at us. <coughs> the th issue is that uh, in our country, we have very uh, different layers of problems. And if those of uh, you who have observed uh, Jammu and Kashmir and other uh, areas in India, our problems do not emanate from within. Most of them uh, come from outside. And uh, <coughs> We all understand what the power of social media is and the scale of, uh, and the kind of problems uh, communications can uh, create. So if in that uh, context, if there is a choice to be made, what choices would you make? First of all, would you like to defend life and property or would you rather have some other kind of facilities being given out? So when it comes to making those choices in the peculiar situation that we are in, we have to make the choice about <coughs> protecting life and property. So therefore, uh, the kind of mechanisms that are used and the kind of social media uh, instruments are that are used, the kind of way fake news is used <coughs> in this country is, can be a, a problem. So yes, I agree that there is a need for having uh, digital rights and, uh, because today it's, it's a basic need. But then again, you do deprive people of basic needs when you have to protect the larger good. And the other issue about uh, availability of uh, internet and connectivity in, in India, yes, it's an issue. There is a price war going on. But I think we also, it's an, uh, is a consequence of uh, the way it was, uh, the way people are trying to outdo each other to provide even cheaper services. So th that's not an issue so much of capacity and capability as much as it is of the economics of it. I think that will get rectified very soon. I have a few quick comments, but I'll try to make them quick, and then we'll, we'll have the last round. Uh, very often you find that Lowe is trying to chase code and doesn't quite catch up with it, but it's still striking. I'm going to address the issue of internet shutdown. In the Indian case, we do have a Supreme Court decision which takes the government to tax, not 100%, I would say 
perhaps, uh, but challenges the uh, wide, the width and the duration uh, of the internet shutdown and talks about the, the need for what it calls proportionality. So here we do have some checks and balances, and that of course is the issue with some other systems we've been uh, discussing. On, on, on the issue of believability of some or available solutions, just very quick fact. The reason uh, Huawei, to, to name it again, is so believable is that China has a $200 billion plan of infrastructure subsidized uh, for internet and it's sure to get a, a large pie of it. So the economies of scale are already achieved. We have absolutely no idea whether their prices are real market prices or whether they factor in these huge economies of scale. So that's one thing. It's not going to change ultimately the decisions of, other, of some others perhaps, but that's very strong. Another company that's entirely believable because it's taking a huge risk uh, is, in my view, Samsung, which has decided to invest $22 billion uh, roughly on 5G uh, networks uh, and is really trying to leapfrog the situation. Uh, the European situation is not that we don't have the solution. Almost 50% of uh, 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 patents uh, on 5G are, are European. It's an issue of scale, of industrial scale. And the problem is financing, and like America, we gave up industrial policy and largely gave up subsidies. The EU, the Commission, on its website, has a boast that over five years it's going, it, it, it's devoting 600 or 700 million dollars, all in all, to digital infrastructures. Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a drop in the bucket, clearly, when you compare it. So that's an issue. In the US, uh, we now have the Senator's initiative to give a $1 million fund. Uh, to developing other uh, solutions. Uh, you will note that the uh, restrictions I mentioned in the beginning yesterday uh, uh, include the fact that some foreign providers can be, ba can be barred uh, from the uh, open subsidy scheme for research and development, but that implies, in fact, that the U.S. is speeding up public aid, uh, public support, at least to the research stage. Uh, in this, and that I think is quite important. That's why I asked the uh, Open Radio Access Network, which is done also with the Japanese, because it could speed up. In other words, both the Europeans and the US are faced with the issue of putting their actions behind their words in terms of industrial policy without violating WTO rules, uh, without you know creating uh, white elephants, uh, but that's where we are. So I think, uh, firstly, my name is Rajan Luthra. I'm from Reliance Industries. We operate uh, Geo, which is the world's largest data network. Uh, my response was going to be to the gentleman who just left the room. Uh, just to <laughs> clarify, <laughs> uh, we, we have 4G coverage uh, in 95% of the country's population, and uh, it's working fine. We monitor each of our 200,000-plus towers in real time. So I don't think the situation in India is as bad. We've invested over $20 billion in setting up that infrastructure on 4G in a matter of a very few years. Uh, 370 million plus customers are satisfied on that. But I think coming to the main question I have for the panel. Uh, I think uh, the main point on one side, we are saying that Huawei, which is uh, very affordable as uh, 5G technology, and uh, then there is a choice between that and a very limited alternative suppliers. Uh, I think in this particular case, since it is such a dicey matter that we've not even been able to come to any potential solutions uh, after the end of the panel, I think is it not uh, a potential option for the partners that are working on providing these solutions, at least in this particular case, make some exceptions for some kind of financial support to the countries that are trying to juggle with this decision. Uh, for countries like India, it's still maybe not, it is an affordability issue, but it's still not that big an issue. How can the governments uh, support some of these companies in making their solutions affordable and thereby more scalable? I'm told I have to close the session. Um, it was really just, a, sorry, I'm uh, Clara Guilla from, from Germany. Um, it's really just a quick follow-up on what you discussed with regards to norms and accountability. Because uh, I think one of you also brought up the example of hospital infrastructure, for example. 
and in my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong, but this would already be covered under international law, um, that, you know, that, uh, an attack on somebody's ho hospital infrastructure, for example. And um, when you dis discuss accountability, do you, do you have a hope or an expectation that it's possible to have greater accountability than what we're already being able to implement under international law at the moment? Let's be, it's, it's, it's uh, 2.50, I should close. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to infringe the organizers and ask for very, very quick one minute uh, answers by those who want to answer. Chris, I think you're a candidate. And uh, Alina might add to this. Uh, yes, I think there is an aspiration, I think an achievable aspiration to have more accountability. Part of that is calling out conduct that we think crosses the line on these norms. Uh, part of it is uh, better evidence of what's going on. I think there's some ways we can get this out to the public and to other governments. And I do think the, uh, uh, it wasn't just the hospitals, it's critical infrastructure. And there's a question about whether that violates international law now. It certainly violates domestic laws, but we want to make it clear. And th this is even agreed to in the UN recently. Thank you, Elena, and then I, sh I just end. So just two words, political will and accountability and enforcement. Mm -hmm. 